Wilson with the Jesus Walk Bible Study Series. Uh, I want to talk with you today about the seven essential elements for growing as disciples. Many of you have grown up without particularly deliberate discipleship. Maybe there's been no one in your life that can provide that kind of encouragement and function for you. And you sense the need to be discipled by somebody to, to somehow jumpstart your growth and get growing again. Some of you are in leadership positions and, and you're giving out and you're giving out, but you just feel like you need to be grounded yourself. You need to be poured into afresh. You feel stunted, need to break out. Well, I hope that this will help you figure out, with the help of the Holy Spirit, how to go about doing that. So what I want to do in this uh, time we have is to help you understand the essential elements for disciple growth in the disciple growth process so that you and the Holy Spirit can get you unstuck. I see that there are seven elements. Now, it's kind of fortunate to have seven elements because that's the perfect number, but it really comes down to about that. Number one, an essential, of course, is an open heart. In the parable of the sower, Luke uh, quotes Jesus as saying, As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So this honest and good heart is an essential of the person that, that starts to bear fruit. This kind of person breaks free of thorns that choke off the fruit from maturing the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and you know those struggles. Uh, this open heart includes humility, a willingness to be corrected and to learn and then to obey what Jesus is saying. What it comes down to is a surrender to Jesus, a surrender to Jesus, not just once, but a process of surrendering. Uh, Sam Shoemaker said one time, I think really helpful, Give as much as you know of yourself to as much as you know of God. And of course, as you give yourself and learn more of God, then you have more to give to a greater God. Your capacity increases. So it starts with an open heart, and that starts with repentance and just coming to Jesus on your part. Number two, the essential element of the word. This was the seed, of course, in Jesus' parable of the sower. And I believe it, it means regular exposure to Jesus' teachings in the Bible. Uh, for many of you, I think it's important that you find Christian teachers or pastors who preach the word that you can sit under and learn from. Now, just listening isn't enough. Uh, but those who have studied this have found that the greatest spiritual growth comes from reflection on the word. Not only listening, but then, okay, what does that mean? Grapple with it, and then what do I need to do? Uh, this, I think, works best with a small group of people. Uh, a small group, some friends, uh, people that are, that are really trying to seek after God. Because it, what I found, it takes time to process things. We hear it, but to really understand it so that we can start to incorporate it into our life takes processing. That takes other people and reflection. I think of Jesus sitting around the, the campfire after he and his disciples have been out ministering all day and teaching, and their t disciples are talking about his parables, and they're talking about what does that mean, and why did Jesus do that, and what about that lady that came and got healed? Uh, there's a learning process going on related to the word, but it's then that reflective process. And this is where uh, my Jesus Walk Bible Study series comes in. I've just uh, revised my disciple training, discipleship training in Luke's Gospel that looks in detail at how Jesus trained disciples and using the Gospel of Luke as the basis and, and trying to understand what was he doing, what was his method, and then what, as we disciples, what are we supposed to get out of that, that uh, teaching, that saying, that healing, that encounter with a person? What are we supposed to learn? Uh, those, that series 
includes not only the teaching and some stories that uh, help me understand, but also then uh, discussion questions that will help you grapple with and start to process that material. The third essential that I see is a mentor. Call, a, call this person what you want. Maybe this is a pastor. Maybe this is a small group leader. Maybe this is a, uh, uh, a teacher. Maybe it's a youth group leader, a discipler. Um, it doesn't have to be, for those of you who are a little bit older, it doesn't have to be someone who's older than you. It could be someone who is your peer who is equally serious about um, following Jesus. It could be a prayer partner. It could be just a couple of people that team up to hold each other accountable. Um, it needs to be someone, though, to whom you, could, you can submit for counsel and guidance and rebuke as needed. As I've studied Jesus' teaching, rebuke was an important part of how those disciples learned. Someone that you can receive a rebuke from and still love. That's, it, it's so important. When we try to do this by ourselves, we don't have that kind of feedback that I really think is important. Of course, this happens in the home all the time. You have little children and they learn to act like their parents act. I was at a, a park that had a big pond and a whole bunch of geese with their little goslings. And the little goslings, when the mother and father got into the water, the little goslings would trot down to the edge and start swimming after them. <laughs> Uh, it's called patterning in, in biological science. And when you're younger, especially, to have somebody that you can um, pattern your life after, you see how they live, and then start doing that, that requires uh, being invited into their life. Now, this happens naturally in a Christian family, uh, particularly if the parents are deliberate about it. But uh, some, kind, some leaders are just open about their lives and let people see them warts and all and come and journey with life with them. And that can be a wonderful experience to, to ground a person in Christ. So a mentor, whether it is someone who's older than you or more experienced in the faith than you, or perhaps someone who's your, a similar age and maturity, but to whom you can submit yourself for counsel, guidance, and rebuke. The fourth element that's essential is an active devotional life. This is a regular practice daily of worship, reading the word, reflecting on the word, listening for God's voice, and prayer. You know, uh, I've been doing this for many, many years, and sometimes I get sort of dry and, you know, this isn't working. Something I discovered, uh, oh, five or six years ago, was how important singing worship is at the beginning of my quiet time. Uh, so I have a guitar hanging on the wall, and I pull it down, and, and I, I plan on singing three songs, sometimes it's more, to get my heart towards Jesus and opened up. Otherwise, uh, that connection isn't there, and reading the word and prayer can be just kind of dull and by rote. So whether you're a singer or not, find some way, just open up and worship your with your heart as you begin. Um, read the word uh, on a regular basis, and I try to read w widely through the scripture. Reflecting on it, what does this mean? What does it say? Listening for God's voice. I've written a series called Listening for God's Voice that I encourage you, if you haven't already taken that series, five lessons, uh, do that. It'll help you. It'll help open you up and make you more sensitive to how God might speak to you. And then finally, a time of prayer, talking with God about your day to come, uh, repentance from sins you know about, confession, praying for other people, just submitting yourself to the Lord at the beginning of the day. Uh, cultivate a deliberate openness to the Holy Spirit. And as you do that, uh, you'll grow as a disciple. This is a, an essential, an active devotional life. Number five is service or ministry experiences and maybe involvement, an ongoing involvement. Sometimes we get in the mode of receiving. 
well, that didn't minister to me or whatever. We, you know, it's how it, it's, we're self-centered. And that's not the role of a disciple. A disciple is someone who starts caring about others and giving of oneself. And so uh, as we learn to give and receive that pattern, we grow. If we can't learn that, we won't grow as well-rounded disciples at all. We'll still be selfish. We'll still be, um, what does this do for me rather than how can I serve others? So I would look for opportunities for ministry or service that include some debriefing, some feedback from the person that, that is uh, kind of leading that ministry. Because um, we're just learning and it's okay to learn and it's okay to make mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. That's what life is. Uh, just doing stuff without feedback isn't as helpful as getting feedback. You know, Jesus would would talk to his disciples. They came back from this missionary journey, 70 of them. He sent two by two, 35 teams would, went out and uh, preached the gospel. They came back. They said, oh, this is so exciting. We were casting out demons and they obeyed us. It was cool. And Jesus said, instead, be thankful that your names are written in heaven. Part of this um, service and ministry experiences is finding your own spiritual gift mix or the, the gifts that God's given you. And my experience is with this, we don't find that overnight. You, you have to have all these uh, spiritual gift tests, maybe you've taken one, and they can be helpful, but really you start learning from doing. You find stuff that doesn't work very well for you. You find stuff that you just love and you want to do more of. It's very, very likely that those include your spiritual gifts. So service and ministry experiences are part of this discipleship process that we see in Jesus' ministry and we need to reproduce in our own. Number six, related of course to this, is stewardship. A willingness to give generously. A willingness to give generously. The first thing, the most precious thing you have is time. And the willingness to give that generously is huge. Um, give time to people. Give time to God's work. Give time to the Lord in the morning, day by day, as you seek him rather than rush. Stewardship of your time. Of course, uh, you've heard probably thousands of uh, uh, stewardship sermons about giving money. Uh, the Baptists say that you need to get baptized along with your wallet. <laughs> That's true, though. You know, I'm convinced that unless you really learn to, to give your finances generally, you can't really get freed from greed and possessiveness. Part of that stewardship, I think, is taking responsibilities in God's household for various parts of, of ministry. Uh, Jesus told the parable of the talents in Matthew. It's called the parable of the minas or the pounds in Luke. And uh, the, the king goes off to, on this long journey and he says to his servants, uh, take this money and do business with it until I return. So it's a long, long time later when he returns and he brings each of the servants before him and he says, well, what did you do with the, with the money that I gave you? And one of them says, well, look, I had these, uh, these, this one mina and I made 10, I got 10 minas now and here it is. And the servant's excited and the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Another servant comes up and he says, well, you gave me this one mina, but look, I've got five. Isn't that amazing? And the, the, the master smiles and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Then the one guy shows up. He says, I knew you were a hard man. You tried to get something where you weren't doing the work yourself. You're trying to get us to work for you. And so I just buried it in the ground so I'd have it to give to you when you got back. And Jesus looks at him and said, you wicked servant. Not serving Jesus with the talents the spiritual gifts that he has us is wickedness. It is selfishness. God gives things to us and then holds us accountable. So I, stewardship in a disciple is really, really important. 
Number seven, being part of a caring Christian community. Now, I know that many of you, if you've been in church for some time, have, have been hurt. I mean, there's some pretty rasty people in churches. Uh, I've seen some pretty dysfunctional churches. And you may have, and you've given up, and you may watch uh, some church on television or listen to the radio, but you've given up on being part of a community. My dear friend, it's so important that you find a community. Now, if you're looking for a perfect church, even if you find one, good luck, because as soon as you join it, it's no longer perfect. I mean, we are just human beings, and we're sinners, and Jesus is working in our hearts and changing us. We're people in process, but the way Jesus set up his kingdom and his disciples is for them to be part of a Christian community, together, growing together, uh, a worshiping, loving Christian community. One of the processes here is learning to love hard to love people, and there are plenty of those around. If you isolate yourself from people like that and refuse to love them, the fruit of the Spirit doesn't grow in you. You can't isolate yourself for any length of time and still keep growing. Now, during the this COVID uh, lockdown that some of us has experienced, it's hard to get together, but we can get together on the phone. We can get together by Zoom. We can, we can work with others even though we don't have the same flexibility we used to. But we must. We're part of a community. Jesus has called us to the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones who gather together. Uh, <clears throat> one reason is you have spiritual gifts that the people in a Christian community need. And what's more... They have spiritual gifts that you need to help grow you to maturity. We're not designed to be Lone Ranger Christians. We're designed to be followers of Jesus together in the kingdom of God. So these are the seven. I'll go through them again. One, an open heart. Two, the word and reflecting on the word. Three, a mentor of some sort. Four, an active devotional life. Five, service or ministry experiences with some feedback and debriefing. Six, stewardship. Seven, be part of a caring Christian community. Now, <clears throat> you may well be tempted to omit one of those. Well, I just, I just can't do that. Okay, I, I hear you. But I want to say to you as a pastor that's worked in ministry for over 50 years, if you leave out any of these essentials, you won't grow the way Jesus wants you to grow. You'll grow some, but the more you leave out, the more messed up you are. You know, if you take a round rubber ball and let it sit on the floor for a few months and then try to roll it across the floor, it goes thump, 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 thump as the flat side keeps hitting the floor. You can be like that. You're not well-rounded. You're, you're grown in some areas, but in other areas you're weak. And I really, really encourage you, all seven of these are important to you. I haven't, none of these are optional. They're all important to you. And so I really want to encourage you, embrace the life of a disciple that Jesus has for you. Give yourself to it. Even, even if parts of it may be uncomfortable for you, do you really want to grow in Christ? then follow through with what I've said. It's sound. You can check it out in the Word. And I ask you, what elements are missing from your life? And what creative things can you do to find ways to add those elements to your, your spiritual life and growth? Some of these won't be easy. Some of these are sitting in front of you waiting. I encourage you, pray and ask God, show me, Lord, how to add stewardship. Show me how to add a caring Christian community. I don't know of one in my area. Ask God. He's your Lord. He will lead you. The goal we have is to become a servant pleasing to our master, moldable, usable, and blessed. 
in his loving hands. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. We desire to grow, to be the disciples that you want us to be. Some of us, O oh Lord, are kind of lopsided disciples. We need some help. I pray that you would help my brothers and sisters to get on a new growth track with you, that they might become, with your help, the help of your Holy Spirit and the others that you provide in your kingdom, they might be disciples indeed. And, you, and they might be productive disciples that you will use in all sorts of different ways, oh God. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Go out there and give them heaven.